this conversation could not be more critical and timely at this moment. And that's because uh, congressional leaders and the Trump administration are right now in fierce negotiations over the next stimulus package, which will likely be the last stimulus package before uh, until after the November election. And there are such high stakes in these negotiations. And what we're going to be talking about today are the stakes for our public postal service. As we are uh, recording this and broadcasting this, it is not clear right now whether our leaders in Washington are going to step up and come through with the direct emergency relief that the Postal Service needs to survive uh, this crisis and continue providing essential services to Americans across the country, or if they are going to push this vital wildly popular public institution to the brink of bankruptcy at a time when they need, we need them more than ever. So we have a couple of great guests today who are going to share their insights into this situation. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Judy Beard from uh, American Postal Workers Union. IPS has been collaborating with APW for the uh, past couple of years. It's been a, a terrific uh, relationship with this very dynamic union. And Judy brings just incredible experience to her work. In fact, a little later, I'm gonna uh, get the chance to talk to her about uh, her firsthand experience in one of the most historic and famous labor struggles in our country, which was the 1970 postal workers strike. Um, but first we'll have her talk about what's going on uh, with the Postal Service in this time of crisis. APWU, as many of you know, represents over 220,000 public postal employees and I think a couple thousand more in the private mailing industry. They represent uh, clerks in post offices. Uh, letter carriers are represented by another union, but they're all working together because postal workers right now are on the front lines of the public health crisis, the economic crisis, and this political fight over crisis funding um, it, during the time of the pandemic. I'm going to share a few slides of, uh, based on our own IPS research about what's happening with the financial system situation at the Postal Service and why it's so important that we all demand that they get the relief that they need right now. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Scott Klinger, who is an IPS Associate Fellow, uh, but also works, his main job is with our wonderful ally, Jobs with Justice. He's a Senior Equitable Development Specialist over there. And Scott is going to really inject a lot of positivity and optimism into this discussion be because he's going to talk about how we not only need to defend the Postal Service, but uh, we should be thinking about how we can actually build on this incredible, vast network that has been developed over the past more than 200 years. Uh, and we've all, uh, at, as Americans, contributed to this. And it's uh, gone through many different innovation, innovations and changes to meet the needs of the American people. And there's a lot of creative ideas about how we could be even more important and expand into services that are direly needed uh, in the 21st century. Um, but first, we're going to start with Judy Beard, the Legislative Director of, Ameri of the American Postal Workers Union. And Judy, maybe the place to start is to talk about how has the Postal Service um, been affected by this crisis? How have the workers that your union represents been affected by this crisis? Thank you, Sarah Anderson, for having me on this show. And our membership, our 220 million postal employees are devastated, like all workers that are essential workers today. Uh, it's stressful enough to have to go to work every day, but to come back home and wonder whether or not, you know, you've been infected by a virus that can kill people. So uh, our, our workers but are unique in that they want to get the work done every day. They want to provide that public service to the American people, medicine and essential goods. And they go with such a positive attitude every day at work. So it's so important that during uh, this pandemic that the Postal Service uh, receives money uh, from the stimulus that they're discussing came right now because the Postal Service could run out of money. And the money that the Postal Service needs is all COVID-related. 
for lost revenue and expenses. Uh, and other companies have gotten billions of dollars, uh, you know, for, for during this um, crisis that we're having in, in the United States, but the Postal Service has gotten zero, absolutely nothing. And that's just devastating to the workers. But they still have that positive attitude that they are at work to serve the American public. Absolutely. Th thanks for that. Yeah, the, the Postal Service never had the option of laying off workers, you know, during this crisis. They have kept going to work every day, delivering the essentials that people really need. And um, they should expect, I think, to be supported by their government in, uh, in, in providing these essential services. But what is ha <coughs> happening with the legislation? Well, um, right <laughs> now, um, the Republicans in the Senate just introduced their, their bill uh, for this next stimulus. And the Postal Service is not in it. However, in the HEROES Act, the Postal Service is in it for $25 billion uh, and money even for vote by mail uh, that, that is certainly needed in this country because we're all faced with an election coming up and we wanna be able to vote safely. Um, there is also a Senate bill, 4174, that's a bipartisan bill that was introduced recently. And uh, that also has $25 billion uh, dollars for the Postal Service in it. And we're hoping that during these um, days of conference that is going on uh, on the Hill, that um, the $25 billion is placed into the next stimulus package and agreed to by all. Um, I, yeah, I think you're muted. Sorry, I muted myself because I was coughing. <laughs> I don't have COVID though, don't worry about that. Um, I was saying, uh, what do you think, that, that, how is it looking right now um, uh, on Capitol Hill? Are there many Republicans who are coming out to support the Postal Service? You know, there was a poll done that showed overwhelming support by Americans across the political spectrum for a, a crisis relief for the Postal Service. I think it was 90% of Republicans and 96% of Democrats. So are Republicans on Capitol Hill listening to their constituents and, and stepping up on this? Well, we would hope that they listen to their constituents. Um, coming publicly uh, in support of uh, money for the Postal Service, there's not very many of them that has been public about this. But the bipartisan bill has a few Republicans on it, that's S4174, but others uh, are receiving phone calls from the public. They're receiving emails from the public. Our, our membership alone made 30,000 calls on the uh, on the 23rd of this month, uh, letting them know how they felt. There's been uh, the public signing petitions, uh, 2 million recently, uh, letting the, the members of Congress know how they felt. So they need to listen to their constituents. They need to listen to them because uh, the Postal Service belongs to the public. It's in the Constitution. It's their, you know, wonderful, a ser service that is provided through, through the Postal Service, mm -hmm. and they, they will be going to the uh, polls shortly. Those numbers are incredible, 30,000 calls and 2 million signatures. Why do you think people care so deeply about the Postal Service? Why are we seeing this outpouring of support for the Postal Service and postal workers right now? Um, it's not just right now. It's always been um, what the highest government agency that had support from the public simply because of the services that is provided by the Postal Service. There are many seniors at home. There are many people living in rural areas that really, really depend on the Postal Service, whether it's to receive that newsletter about the discounts in their area or to receive that check um, during this, these terrible times. Even um, the school children, uh, many of them only received their supplies this year through the Postal Service uh, because they wanted to continue with their education. 
So if people see the value of a, a service that goes to every household at an affordable price okay. and um, just t timely every day. Now, we first got involved uh, in working with APWU um, when the Trump administration first came out with its proposal to privatize the Postal Service and sell it off to the highest bidder, private uh, for-profit uh, corporations. What's the motivation there? Why, why do people continue to push privatization of the Postal Service? Um, simply for one reason only, profit. Um, privatization is about making the millionaires or billionaires even richer. So they see the Postal Service as a means to, you know, make more money for themselves mm -hmm. and forget about the public. And it's so, so clear because with all the employees that work at the Postal Service uh, and the Postal Service not receiving taxpayer dollars, all they could see is lay off a lot of employees, reduce the service, and they could uh, pocket a lot of money. That's great. Well, uh, I gave a little bit of a teaser at the beginning about uh, Judy's fascinating history with the Postal Service, which goes way back. And I, I just want to say that uh, when the pandemic hit, APWU was about to mark the 50th anniversary of the 1970 strike of postal workers. This was, I think it stands as still the largest wildcat strike in U.S. history, meaning that union leadership um, didn't give approval for it, but workers just uh, at the rank and file level really uh, rose up. They um, uh, struck for eight days, more than 200,000 postal workers in dozens of cities, really brought the country's mail service and the economy to a halt. And I would love to hear from you about wh where were you uh, and what were you doing at the time of the 1970 strike? I had just been hired uh, as a postal employee for about a year and a half. And like all postal employees, even today, you take an oath of office uh, that you, you will, you know, do your job with dignity and you will serve the government and, and daily. So, you know, I was honored that I was working at the Postal Service and I was paying my way through college. And I arrived at work one day and there's a picket line and we're on strike and um, I didn't know what to do. So I, you know, went to the restaurant across the street and talked to my friends who didn't know whether we should go in or not go in. And then a woman came in that was a postal employee and she said, wake up, you need to get in this picket line. Uh, that postal employees earned after working for 80 hours, uh, you know, for two week period, still earned a wealth figure. They didn't have enough money uh, to, to pay for food and shelter. They had uh, to get welfare. And that they were so angry that the government had just given themselves about a 40% raise, 40, and gave postal employees a 4% raise. And she, they, she encouraged us to get in that picket line. And I thought for a minute, I said the right thing for me to do, and I've always acted on what I thought was right, was to get in that picket line. And even if I'm put in jail, too bad, it was the right place at the right time to fight back. To, to clarify, it was illegal, technically illegal, right? Uh, the, Absolutely. The it so was there were people on the street saying, don't get in the picket line, you'll be fired, you'll be jailed. Right. And um, people were, you know, young people were confused as to what to do, but we did the right thing. We got in the picket line and we picket. And um, because of that, the salaries of the postal employees today are negotiated by the union and uh, it's, we get a living wage. I have to just ask you to back up a little bit, though, because before you had that victory, President Nixon thought that he knew how to handle uh, postal workers, right? So what was, what was Nixon's response? What did he do to try to keep the mail moving? He sent the armed forces into the post offices across the country to do the work that we would normally be doing, and they could absolutely not do it. They had <laughs> no skill whatsoever in sorting the mail. And 
even today, our postal employees know what they're doing. They can get that letter to you in a day or two days. They can get that package to you. And uh, no one else can do it as well as postal employees. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's amazing to think about that at a time when we're seeing the uh, the current administration sending in federal forces to handle situations in, in, in different places. So, you know, just as a hypothetical, not, not to say postal workers are about to go on strike, but if they did, just as a hypothetical, do you think, you know, Trump could send in uh, folks and, you know, would it just be easy for them to figure out how to deliver the mail to 116 million addresses every day? Could they just hit the ground running and, and make that happen? Or is it a little bit more complicated than that? It's a lot more complicated. <laughs> it takes skill to do the job and the work that postal employees do every day. So uh, the American people already know they will not get their mail. And it's, uh, we're coming up to an election, November the 3rd, and those absentee ballots have to go through the Postal Service. And it's important that postal employees who know how to sort this mail, uh -oh. sort the mail and get it to the right place. Absolutely. Just one more question about the history. You know, I had the great honor of interviewing Danny Glover about his family history with the Postal Service. Um, I'm talking about the actor, Danny Glover. Both of his parents were um, elected officers, I think, in the Postal Service, longtime postal employees. And he saw, they saw it, he said, um, in the 60s and 70s as a place where African Americans could have real opportunities and organizing uh, opportunities. And is that, you were in Detroit. Detroit, right during the 1970s strike did, did you see some of that happening there and and could you say a little bit about um, the, the role of African Americans in the postal workforce today yeah I was very very lucky that my parents um, you know taught me to do what's right and to fight for justice for all and I lived in a neighborhood that was predominantly black so when Martin Luther King came to town when I was 15 years old, my mother dressed us up in our Sunday best and took <laughs> us down to, to march uh, for justice. And I'll always remember that fighting for what is right is our responsibility. That's what they taught me, and that's what I try to teach others, to fight for what's right. And yeah, you know, we might go to jail. We, we might make, you know, the government angry, but we have to fight for what is right or otherwise all of our rights are going to be rolled back. Thank you for sharing that incredible history in a week when we're honoring Congressman John Lewis and everything he did to really put his life on the line and, and take risks. It's, it's so important to hear more stories about how that happened in, in different arenas. And the Postal Service was one place where, where that was also happening. Um, so I, I, unless there's anything else, Judy, you want to add about this current political situation, we will have some Q&A time at the end here. But uh, if not, I think I will just... Um, share my screen for uh, a few minutes to share some slides uh, that really are about reinforcing um, what Judy was saying about the need for financial aid uh, during this time of crisis for the Postal Service. Um, this chart here uh, shows what's been happening with uh, major postal services and what you can see is that uh, first class mail and marketing mail, the revenue has been going down precipitously during the, the economic crisis related to the pandemic. Whereas shipping and packaging, there has been this big boom, almost 60% uh, increase over um, May of last year. Uh, but that increase, that big package boom is very unlikely to be sustainable as more people go back to work. And also with a, an extended uh, recession, the, the demand for e-commerce could be affected as well. And so there is this package boom people have seen you know, a, a lot of uh, packages being delivered, but it's it's concealing other problems uh, with the Postal Service, including the huge drop-off in 
first class mail and marketing mail, which are more, uh, more profitable uh, products and services for the Postal Service. Um, in normal times, I want to make this clear, the Postal Service does not get any taxpayer subsidies. That's a common um, myth, I think, that taxpayers subsidize the Postal Service. In normal times, they cover all of their costs uh, with stamps and, and other services. Um, and so this is really an extraordinary situation, though, under this uh, pandemic. Uh, recently, the Postal Service was pressured by Republican lawmakers to update their economic forecasts. Businesses are not even trying to play this guessing game right now because there's so much uncertainty. But under this political pressure, the Postal Service came out with some new numbers. And you can see here that they looked at both what would happen if package volume stays at 15% above the pre-COVID levels or if it returned to uh, pre-COVID levels. And under both scenarios, there would still be uh, quite large pandemic-related losses, both over the next year and a half or so and also over the next decade. Um, and it's important also to distinguish the current financial crisis related to the pandemic with the ongoing financial challenges uh, of the Postal Service, which are largely due to a decision of a law that was passed in 2006 in Congress to require the Postal Service to pre-fund their retiree health benefits more than 50 years in advance, something that no other government agency or private business is required to do. And the numbers in this chart are not IPS numbers. This table is lifted right out of the Trump Task Force report on the Postal Service chaired by Secretary Mnuchin. And we just highlighted in yellow this row that shows operating income before they, they paid their retiree health benefits. And it shows that between 2013 and 2018, the Postal Service would have been profitable if it hadn't been for this pre-funding mandate that, that no one else um, ha has to do. And so when you hear people say, oh, the Postal Service has been a basket case for a long, long time, uh, you should really clarify that they've had financial challenges that were manufactured by Congress and that in fact, without uh, that pre-funding mandate, they, they would be in much better uh, financial shape. So Congress really needs to come through with the crisis relief, but they also need, need to deal with this pre-funding thing. But there are folks out there who, who get excited when they see um, bad numbers on paper for postal service finances, and that is because it helps justify the calls for privatization. And we, we talked about this earlier, the, um, the White House came out with a recommendation for full privatization in 2008. Um, it's been an ongoing drumbeat by people who um, really would rather see this uh, turned into a for-profit uh, operation. And and at IPS, we did some research to try to figure out, well, what would that really look like if we had a privatized postal service? And one way to get at it is we looked at the extra charges that UPS and FedEx already charge people uh, in certain um, addresses. And what we found is that it's, uh, they're addresses that cover 70 million Americans. So it's not just people living on the top of a mountain or on an island or a tribal community in Alaska or something. It's a million, tens of millions of people in small towns and rural areas that already face extra charges. And without competition from the public postal service, those private companies would absolutely jack up those rates and, and uh, probably cut services to many of these areas. No private for-profit corporation is interested in delivering to uh, these remote far flung places where, where you lose money. But the public postal service does it because they have a universal service obligation uh, enshrined in the constitution. And so they take money from more lucrative parts of the business to cover those rural um, and more remote routes. Finally, and Judy mentioned this, you know, we, we can't have a democracy in 2020 if we do not have the Postal Service. Uh, already 41 states and the District of Columbia are, are allowing no excuse voting by mail. Probably many, many others will follow. There is no other entity that can handle vote by mail besides the Postal Service. And so we, that's just one more reason why we absolutely need to, to protect it. Um, one thing we haven't gotten into too much is that there is a new postmaster general. Um, he is a, a Republican uh, 
fun funder from uh, North Carolina um, and named Louis DeJoy. And you'd think in this, th these times, um, he would be down on Capitol Hill really pushing um, to get the, the, the aid that the Postal Service needs. And we're hoping that he still will do that. But there are a couple things he's done that are a bit disturbing. One is that he's announced new operational changes to eliminate overtime pay for postal workers and reduce transportation costs. All about, you know, he's he's approaching this like we, they can just cut costs, cut, cut, cut their way out of the um, challenges. And what that's going to do is it's going to delay um, getting your mail and getting your packages. Um, and at a time when people need these uh, deliveries more than ever. And what makes it even more crazy is that the, these uh, increased costs are related to the pandemic. The, uh, postal workers aren't getting more overtime because they just want to pad their paychecks. They're getting it because there's a staffing shortage because workers are getting sick. And APWU has had uh, two to 3,000 people um, diagnosed with COVID, at least 25,000 have had to quarantine. Rural letter carriers, as many as up to 20% at one point were unable to work due to illness or taking care of other people in their family. And the transportation costs as well. There's, with the package boom, um, there's more uh, multiple trips having to happen for reloading packages. And so um, that that is a concerning thing. And then the most recent thing, which just happened yesterday, is they announced uh, a $10 billion dollar loan um, for the Postal Service, which will just add to uh, a, an already very large debt burden that the Postal Service is dealing with, uh, instead of the direct aid that uh, USPS needs. And what makes this all the more outrageous is they haven't blinked an eye at giving um, more than $100 billion in cash assistance, so not just more debt but actual cash to private corporations, hospitals, universities, 25 billion alone in cash to the airlines, which are already laying off workers. And so why this, um, you know, resistance to giving the postal service it needs. It doesn't need more debt. It needs the kind of direct aid that so many private businesses have already gotten. So I'm going to um, stop sharing there. And then I just want to introduce uh, our great colleague uh, and friend, Scott Klinger, who I said earlier is an associate fellow of IPS uh, for a long time, but he works for Jobs with Justice and has been an amazing partner on this work to defend the postal service. And um, Scott is going to show a slideshow about some innovative ideas about how the Postal Service of the future. Um, but first, I thought it'd be nice, Scott, if you just also began talking a little bit about what, why are you motivated to, to do this work? Why, why did you start with us two years ago and you jumped in enthusiastically to help defend the Postal Service against uh, privatization attacks? What, what does it mean for you? Make, make sure you're not muted. Had the same problem Jeff Bezos had yesterday. <laughs> Um, thanks so much, Sarah and Judy, for those great presentations. It's been a real pleasure to be a part of this team for the last couple of years, and I've learned a lot. I've always been a big supporter and fan of the post Postal Service, but I've, I've come to learn what it's really meant to this country. Um, my, so my earliest childhood memories are uh, the Postal Service or our letter carrier as the face of the federal government. I understood what government was because of the post office, and I remember a couple of times, especially I, I'm 60 years old, so I was a uh, first man in space child. And uh, a couple of those space launches, our letter carrier came in and watched them on TV with my mom and I. And it was really, you know, part of our family. And, and then when I was a senior in high school, very anxious about my college acceptance letters, our letter carrier, Mr. Phelps, would go to the post office every Sunday. He knew when the trucks were coming from downtown, he'd pour through the bags and see if my acceptance was there. And one Sunday he found it and brought it to my family's house at dinner time. And it was just extraordinary, extraordinary above and beyond service. He, he didn't put in for overtime. It was just him being a good guy and trying to help a kid who was kind of freaking out. Um, my wife and I moved to rural Maine, uh, small town Maine, actually, um, uh, four months ago. And I've really come to recognize what an incredible, it's not a, it's not a service, it's an essential um, for people in small towns and rural areas. And um, Sarah mentioned, you know, no, nobody else serves here. We've been here four months and we're at a bunch of packages. Some of them started out in FedEx's and UPS's hands, but almost all of them have been delivered by our local uh, rural letter carrier. Um, I've only seen UPS truck in our driveway once and I'm not 
quite sure why they do they do deliver but i couldn't mail a package on ups unless i was willing to drive 40 or 50 miles and pay a lot more um so th those things have been really important and and it's not something um any of us should take for granted i don't think anybody on, on this call does um i'm going to share my screen and, and um run through some slides everybody see that Okay, um, so as Sarah really well described, the new um, post, new post office, the Postal Service Administration and the Trump Administration are really approaching the challenges of the Postal Service by thinking they can cut their way out of this problem, cut service, delay, delay deliveries, um, layoff workers, and this is like so out of line for what, what the post office has done for 245 years. The U.S. has had plenty of problems. They've had world wars. They've had other pandemics in 1918. They've had um, civil strife, they've had uh, slavery, racism, everything that is still in our world today. And yet every challenge they've met as a, and looked at for the opportunity to serve and broaden its ser the service and, and in doing so has kept itself safe and strong and growing. So just a few um, examples. So in the, we know in the middle uh, 19th century, gold was discovered in California and lots of people moved west to, to, to seek their opportunity. And um, the Postal Service responded. They uh, established the Pony Express and cut the delivery times from the Mississippi River to California by 10 days by having this network of fast riders that literally just jumped off and swapped one horse for another every so often. During the Civil War. Are you advancing your slides? Because we don't see that one yet. We just see the first slide. No, I have. Um, I'm not uh, there yet. Okay. But thank you. Um, I, added two, I added two of my own before the slide just started. Um, then during the Civil War, um, 1862, the post office launched railroad post offices. So uh, trains would pick up mail in one town and, and, and clerks would sort it, on, sort it on the train and drop it off in the next. And by the end of the 19th century, it was possible to mail a letter in New York City um, in the morning and have it delivered in Boston in the afternoon. In part, that's because they had twice a day deliveries in, in uh, downtown Boston back in the uh, late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, so all those things were to get people's mail faster, more efficiently, and affordably. Um, in 1897, uh, so early on, the post office mostly delivered in cities, and uh, the, half the country was living in rural areas, and it became a really big problem. So they extended rural free delivery in, 19, in 1897, and it was huge. I just read a book of, of Maine history, and one of the uh, little paragraphs in it talked about how the families were so excited when they got rural free delivery because it the post office was three miles away and it took them two hours to get there. Um, you know, like we think of that as crazy, but that's what life was um, not that long ago. And so it really opened connected markets. It allowed people in cities to sell to people in uh, rural areas and for people in rural areas to get their products back to consumers in cities. Uh, they extended that further in 1913 uh, by uh, creating Parcel Post, which uh, was the opened the door to the e-commerce, the Amazon world of the 20th, early 20th century. Sears um, sold, sent catalogs, these big, heavy, four-page, 1,400-page catalogs um, to, to um, anybody who wanted them in America, and they could begin to order 100,000 products. So, you know, it didn't matter whether you lived in farmland with your neighbors miles apart, or if you lived in a block of row houses in Manhattan, you could get the same products and be part of the same country. Uh, a few years after that, 1918, uh, airmail was started, and um, again, it was it was both to um, get uh, mail there faster, but it also had the side effect of creating the commercial airline industry and giving uh, startup carriers their first businesses, out of which today's uh, massive airline networks were born. Um, I meant to mention one thing when I was talking about row free delivery. One of the uh, kickers there was people had to petition for it and they were quick, the post office was quickly overwhelmed by the number of petitions, but they also had to guarantee that they had roads that could um, service uh, new uh, rural routes. So cities all over the country invested in fixing up their roads. So they created an incentive, you'll get mail if you fix your roads and the country got better for it. That's been the story of the post office, innovation, investing in communities and making America strong while also making the post office strong. It doesn't work to cut your way to prosperity. So one of the biggest opportunities um, for the post office is in financial services. 
And postal banking is common in many other countries. The U.S. has its own history in providing financial services. Um, postal money orders, which is pretty much the only financial service the post office offers these days, was also started during the Civil War because the banking system was so um, patchwork and there wasn't a common currency. And uh, the Postal Service made created with money orders a, a way that was safe and easy to move money around the country. Uh, in the late 19th century, there was a big financial panic recession and um, many people got wiped out uh, by that. And when the economy recovered, they refused to reinvest in commercial banks. They didn't trust them. So in 1910, Congress passed the Postal Savings Bank Act and soon uh, Americans from coast to coast could open savings accounts to pay 2% interest and, and offer, also offer CDs at higher rates. Um, and by 1947, that uh, postal banking system had $3.4 billion, which is almost $40 billion in today's dollars, and accounted for one in every $10 that Americans had in their savings accounts. Um, we came come forward many more years uh, to the uh, 1990s and the big banks got threatened by the banking, by the postal banking, and uh, worked to lobby Congress to make postal render postal banking obsolete and and and, and ended it. Um, but by 2008, when the banking crisis happened, between 2008 and eight years later, in 2016, 6,000 bank branches were closed across the country. 93% of them in poor communities where median income was below the national average. Um, so by 2014. 59% um, of the nation's zip codes had uh, one bank or no banks in them, and uh, a quarter of the country was deemed uh, underbanked or unbanked by a FDIC study. Um, so there was a huge need for um, services that um, have not, haven't still not been met. And other countries have addressed this. The first class mail is falling all over the world. It's not a US phenomenon. Um, but other countries have really stepped up aggressively on offering financial services like ATMs and bill paying and check cashing and electronic money transfers, um, remittances to foreign countries, as well as checking in savings accounts. And globally, um, financial services and the global post offices uh, account for nearly 17% of postal revenue. In the US, it's stuck at 0.2%, which is just the sale of a few money orders. So there's a huge opportunity there to really bring in much more revenue. And one way to jumpstart this is um, to, to create a partnership between the Federal Reserve and uh, the Postal Service. The Federal Reserve is talking about creating a Fed account for every American. Every bank in the country has a Fed account, and it's where you can put your money and then Fed administers it, and take it out the next day, and it's how banks keep themselves afloat and share money amongst themselves through the Fed. Um, you know, we're all aware that the, the Congress is starting to talk about a second stimulus check. And they're doing so when 35 million Americans have not yet received their first check that was supposed to go out three months ago. And part of the problem is finding these, finding people and having them get their money. And lots of people don't have bank accounts, so how do they cash it? They have to sometimes pay a fee to cash their stimulus check and a uh, predatory lender gets a cut of the money that's supposed to help families. Um, but uh, if the Fed Accounts for All was launched, um, and it's part of the Democratic platform uh, at this point, um, any American could go into uh, any post, any one of 31,000 post offices and, and get their federal money. It could also be used for Social Security checks um, or um, tax refunds or if we ever went to a um, guaranteed uh, income, uh, universal basic income, it could be used to distribute that as well. Uh, the next opportunity is um, participating in the caring, uh, caring economy, uh, which is growing very rapidly and expected to grow even more as America ages. Uh, the letter carriers launched a free service called Carrier Alert, and uh, elderly people can sign up and put a little sticker on their mailbox, and if the carrier notices that mail hasn't been picked up or suspects something's wrong, they alert social service agencies to then pick it up and, and check it out further and make sure that the uh, resident is okay. Um, several countries in the world are really making this a big part of their business strategy. Japan and France um, both have programs that have generated substantial revenue for their postal services, um, Japan has a program uh, that includes monthly half hour visits that the family of the elderly person pays for um, to assess the, the elderly person's condition. And the Postal Service also gives them uh, an iPad and teaches them how to use it uh, and helps them to um, send emails and share pictures and other things, both with their family and communicate with healthcare providers. Uh, and, and then Japanese um, 
has combined Japan has combined it with their postal banking system, which gives the elderly access to their money without ever having to leave their home. So they just transfer funds among their postal banking account. France has a program uh, called the Watch Over My Parents program. Uh, it has, actually has a French name, but I'm not so good at French, so that's what it translates. And customers pay $20 a month, and they get a 15-minute weekly visit with their letter carrier. And during the visit, the postal worker asks seniors a few questions and chats with them for a while and then sends a report to the family members to let them know how their relative is doing. The um, Inspector General of the Post Office has said this is a great opportunity to expand revenue and to increase services the post office provides and suggest other things as well like the EPS the USPS could uh, rent out unused window space for community wellness services or help signing up for social security or food assistance or even as a place to access the internet we know that lots of post offices are have uh, unused windows at this point and they could be used for something to uh, make it a public place that communities can access community service providers can access customers um, the post office has an enormous um, fleet and as well as a, a large number of workers, 215,000 vehicles and 300,000 letter carriers uh, pass every address in the United States every day. And uh, this could be also used to generate additional revenue. Postal trucks could be outfitted with um, sensors to report potholes, traffic conditions, bridge, con bridge conditions, snow and ice in the winter, things that need tending to, even natural gas leaks or even to man monitor climate um, conditions, uh, greenhouse gases or other things, um, pollutants, things like that. And letter carriers um, you know, are passing every house so they could report uh, fallen tree limbs or water and sewer problems, damaged public property or blighted private property that need follow up by public officials, local public officials, overflowing trash cans, holes in sidewalks, unremoved snow, the list is, is pretty much endless. Sarah talked about the um, 41 states in District of Columbia that are going to rely on the mails uh, to hold this fall's elections. And uh, so it's very, you know, there's all kinds of public discourse about this and the president's on one side and almost all of the Americans on the other side. Um, but um, it's, this isn't just a one shot deal um, for the needs in a public health crisis. It's an ongoing issue because uh, research shows that vote by mail uh, in boost participation rates. Uh, one of the most dramatic examples happened outside of DC in Rockville, Maryland, where um, the participation, voting participation almost doubled after the city adopted vote by mail in 2019. And it also benefits uh, disabled people, seniors and rural voters, uh, and disproportionately low income people, all of those, all of those folks. Uh, many uh, voting sites are currently less accessible or non-accessible or rural people have to incur large drive, large drive, far long drives to get to their polling places. So um, it's it, boost participation like that. And then there's been a Pew study that suggests uh, in Colorado where they do only voting by mail that they save 40% on their election costs each year. So it's a, it's a money saver. Um, and then uh, a couple more things. I know we're running a little long, but um, so food security is an issue. We're seeing more and more families without um, food and and people trying to shorten supply chains and grow more local agriculture. Hundred years ago, uh, farmers depended on uh, uh, U.S. mail to ship farm eggs to urban markets. And even today, this is one of the great things that Sarah and I learned that the post office still, still ships stale chicks from hatcheries to uh, farm families who are looking to raise chickens. And uh, so they have a very uh, demonstrated ability over a century to handle perishable foods and eggs and baby chicks and could use that to get farm to table um, food to especially people in need where boxes could be dropped off at local grocery, uh, local post offices and the post office could do the last mile delivery which they do so well to take them to families in need especially seniors and shut-ins um, then um, the post office has long been a leader in environmental sustainability they have a uh, um, not only greening their own uh, infrastructure but they have a um, pr program called the Blue, Blue Earth Program, where they offer a range of services to the public and private sector, including collecting used electronic and printer ink cartridges from all federal agencies and recycling them without the shipping and disposition costs. So they earn something on the sale of the cartridge, just like when you go into Staples and they give you two or three bucks uh, credit for your old cartridges. The post office uh, receives that money in exchange for doing the right thing and making sure these things are not uh, tossed in a landfill, but are in fact reused. And um, they could, and they're also um, 
providing large mailers with uh, carbon footprint data. They have extensive modeling about how their own operations are affecting the environment and they're selling that to some large, um, large customers right now. So they could be extending that. Uh, they're, they're also looking at, they've invested money in solar cells to operate some of the sorting plants and, um, and have plans to think about doing that in other locations. So one thing we think they could do is if they end up building, uh, going to some electric fleets, that they could charge the fleets at, postal fleets at night and then in the daytime um, sell that electricity to commuters or shoppers who want to use the post, o post office vehicle parking lots and charge up their vehicles um, uh, via the sun uh, and the investment that's been made by the postal service. Lastly, and this is something I'm aware of and I'm really grateful that my internet hasn't pooped out um, in this last 15 minutes, but um, uh, internet service in rural areas really stinks. It's one of the things that's hampering total economic development in Maine and the state is investing a lot of money to try and address it. But the postal service already has um, high speed internet in every postal uh, post office in the country, no matter how remote or um, out of the way it is. And uh, so we think there's some opportunities maybe for the post office to be a part of building the broadband infrastructure. I think most people are probably aware, but 42 million Americans um, don't have ac don't have access to broadband they, at any price. They can't can't buy it. And um, in rural areas, it's particularly problematic. Um, 100 million people, almost a third of American households, don't have broadband um, in part because they can't get it, in part because they can't afford it. We have extremely expensive internet in the United States. So um, the US could join other nations like uh, the UK and France in um, operating broadband systems throughout the country or at least expanding them into parts of the country that are poorly served. So just a uh, um, few ideas for ways that we can get back to the way the US Postal Service has always done business and that's investing in America by investing in itself and beefing, beefing up its services meeting unmet needs and um, developing new revenue opportunities for the Postal Service um, at the same time. Thank you, Scott. It, it's amazing to think how many of those ideas that we've been kicking around seem even more important now in light of the, the crisis. But, uh, you know, this, this is, uh, you know, all for open to debate and discussion right now. We hope we got other people's creative juices going on, you know, what other ways could the Postal Service become even more valuable to uh, U.S. society? Uh, we have a few um, minutes for uh, Q&A, so I, I will uh, ask our, our guests some of those. And I also just want to acknowledge it's great to see that Lisa Graves from Center for Media and Democracy joined the webinar and shared some of her excellent research on the role of Charles Koch in pushing privatization privatization of the Postal Service and someone has already said that they're going to write a letter to the editor using some of her research and I just want to encourage everybody if you're thinking about writing a letter to the editor do it now we have a short window here to push Congress to come through with the emergency relief the Postal Service needs to survive this crisis and keep serving everyone in this country. So now is the time to speak out. Um, I just can't stress that enough. Um, so some of the uh, people questions that people have submitted through the, the Q&A um, thing. Um, one is, uh, is there any way to, to remove the Postmaster General? What is the process around, you know, selecting um, the, the head of the U.S. Postal Service and, you know, who really has the authority to choose and to remove uh, Postmasters General? Judy, do you know the answer to that? Uh, yes, um, the Postmaster General is appointed by the Postal Board of Governors. And um, currently we have four uh, Board of Governors that are Republican and two that are Democrat. And they are the ones that selected the joint. So um, that process in reverse, I believe, is the process for removal. Okay. So pressure on the Postal uh, Board of Governors would, would be the way to do it. And, and for the postmaster's not on the ballot in November. We can't just vote him out. <laughs> it's going to have to take some different strategies there. Um, another question was about, um, would it take a constitutional amendment to privatize the Postal Service? Since the Postal Service is embedded in the Constitution, wouldn't it be kind of unconstitutional to privatize it? I don't know if Scott or, or Judy want to comment on that question. I'm a yield to Scott. <laughs> I 
You're muted. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and certainly not a constitutional lawyer. Uh, I think it gives Congress the authority over the Postal Service. Um, so I'm not sure it would be as cut and dry as saying there has to be a public post office. Um, the Congress would, even if it was privatized, uh, I think Congress and the Board of Governors would have some say over the rules, especially things like universal service. Um, you know, they couldn't sell it off to FedEx and FedEx turn around and go, well, we're only going to deliver to 20 million households. The other 90 million, 90 million, million of you are on your own. Um, I don't think that would pass constitutional muster, but um, it's possible. I mean, the Postal Service has been privatizing slowly in different pieces uh, over many years, both in Republican and Democratic administrations. And uh, I think there's probably more that can be done without having a constitutional crisis. And that's what we're trying to stop. I'd like to add, um, if the Postal Service runs out of money, uh, which is, you know, is in the, moving in the direction by next year or sometime to run out of money uh, with first class mail going down and marketing mail going down and, you know, the money that's normally coming into the post office is not, not there. Uh, it could run out of money and we don't know what would happen at that point. Yeah, that, that's a scary um, idea. Um, another person uh, asked about vote by mail and whether privatization could uh, un undermine the legitimacy of, uh, of vote by mail. I think that the answer there is definitely yes. I know I wouldn't feel comfortable ha handing my my vote, my ballot over to a for-profit corporation. But do you guys have anything else to add to that? Well, if, if right now uh, the Postal Service uh, employees are take pride in the work that they do, they make a living wage, they really are not satisfied until they get their work done and then they go home. They get flustered when they leave mail. Now, uh, a privatized company with, with, um, with the federal minimum wage being $7.25 an hour, uh, I can't imagine any employee taking such pride in, in doing their work when they won't even have enough money by payday to feed their family. So I think it's really important not to privatize the postal service. Absolutely. Uh, another person asked about the delays uh, with mail and packages and how much of that might be related to the de decreased number of available flights for the mail um, that would be happening under the pandemic. I don't have any uh, statistics on the flights being impacted, but the number of employees that are homesick or taking care of their parents or their children it has some impact on, on the mail. And so the overtime, you know, that employees were working before the Postmaster General ended it all was to make sure that the mail got out. And now he has ended all the overtime, so the mail is not getting out. And, and another person uh, asked- Can I jump oh, in real quick on that one? Go ahead. So I think one thing to say there too is, um, so my wife and I go out for drives on Sunday and it's not a Sunday we've gone out where the roads aren't full of postal trucks delivering packages um, that are bottlenecked. Um, and part of the problem is, as Sarah said, the package volume's grown a lot, but the post office has not been able to invest to ma ma uh, modernize its fleet. Most of the vehicles, many of the vehicles are approaching three decades in age. Some of them are catching on fire every year just because they're, they're too old. And um, so, one of the things, one of the reasons to help the post office right now is to begin to, uh, they have the vehicles designed and ready to go just to be able to buy them. And we think it's a, a perfectly sound idea to think about, okay, we have all those auto workers out of work and we have the post office needing vehicles. Why don't we put America's auto workers back to work to build American made postal vehicles that are bigger, that they don't have to work on Sundays to deliver packages, that people get their packages sooner. It just seems like a win, win, win.
You're on mute, Sarah. I, I just put a couple of important resources in the, the chat box. One is a, where you can go where, uh, to get all of the Institute for Policy Studies research on many topics related to the Postal Service. What, what's at stake for Black families? for rural communities um, and so forth. And then a link uh, that's maybe even more important, which is a link to the US Mail uh, Not For Sale website, where you can find about how, how can you take action to defend the public postal service. Um, so we, we really hope people are inspired to, to uh, step up now. As I said, it's a really critical moment during this narrow window when Congress is negotiating um, the next stimulus package. We have maybe one more minute uh, Judy or Scott, do you have any final words? I just want to thank the postal workers that are working every day during this pandemic. Uh, I know they work every day regardless, but they're really doing a wonderful job and they're heroes uh, to the American people. Absolutely. Scott? I'll echo that and say, and they do their work joyfully. Um, some of the happiest moments of my day have been in post offices or talking to our rural carrier and they always have a smile and they're always um, curious about how I'm doing and other customers are doing. So they continue to be a part of the American family and we should support them. Yeah, I'll just say I, I think a lot about my grandfather, who was the uh, postmaster of North Dakota back in the 40s. I've written about how um, uh, my mother's family never knew when they would have Christmas Eve dinner because he would stay at work uh, until every package that could be delivered would be delivered on Christmas Eve. And that is really the ethic of the Postal Service. It's what we want to be rewarding instead of telling people that they can't make deliveries after a certain hour just to cut costs. Cutting cost is not going to be the way to save the Postal Service um, and we all need to stand up and defend it and get it through this tough time and and support it into the future so thank you very much everyone for for joining and um, send us your own thoughts about what should be happening with the Postal Service we'd love to hear from you and thanks again for joining Say check is coming soon. Come on, it box these pain and pay a bill or two. But no more rain will come my way unless I take a stand. The US Post Service darling needs help in hand. Oh, won't you heed this message? Won't you hear my mournful cry? It's hard to keep your wits now with all this death and dying. But hard times will come our way on this you can't rely. Unless the Lord will not be full of our dreadful lies. Our government is doing a disservice to us all. Do not deliver us the mail, it should be against the law. I'm struggling day by day.